Hello again. I hope you guys are doing okay. We, of course, learned this last week that we won't get to go back to the building to finish out the school year, but hopefully we'll be able to make the best of things both in this class and also in your other classes. Before we get into actual teaching this week, I do want to point out that everybody that's in college courses is supposed to take an online survey that evaluates the course that you are in. Uh, we had a Zoom meeting for the dual credit instructors this past week, and honestly, they were more concerned about the paperwork than they were about anyone actually learning stuff. But we hopefully will get that paperwork taken care of. This is linked from my web page, so it's probably easiest just to access it there. But if you can get that taken care of sometime soon, that would be great. As you go through this week's video, you're going to notice a bunch of question marks that are on various screens. And those are your clue that you might want to pause the video and take a minute to work out the example that's on the screen. Rather than putting a bunch of extra time into the video this week, I figured it was easier just to let you pause things as you go along. So with that in mind, we're going to talk this week about what are called definite integrals. You should remember from last week that we learned all about antiderivatives. And we learned things like if you had the antiderivative of 7x cubed, you added 1 to the exponent, x to the fourth, and then you divided by the new exponent, so 7 fourths x to the fourth plus k. We also learned some other basic rules, like for the trig functions, the antiderivatives were sort of the opposite of derivatives. The antiderivative of cosine was sine. The antiderivative of sine was negative cosine. We figured out that the antiderivative of 1 over x was natural log. For e to the x, the antiderivative was itself. And if you had any other number to the x power, you just did that number to the x divided by natural log of that number. All of that stuff that we did last week were called indefinite integrals or general antiderivatives. And something that was, of course, important when you did that is that you had to put plus k or plus c at the end of the problem. That, of course, was the very first question on last week's quiz. And you put it there because technically there were infinitely many antiderivatives. You could have any number at the end of your problem, and it would also be an antiderivative of what you were given. Well, this week we're moving on to what are called definite integrals. And I've got a couple of examples of definite integrals up there. We have the definite integral from 5 to 7 of e to the x dx and the definite integral from 0 to pi over 4 of cosine x dx. The big thing about these is you'll notice there's numbers that are written by the antiderivative sign, and before it was just that symbol with nothing else by it. Those numbers are typically called the bounds, and so you can see a difference here between an indefinite integral like we did last week on the right, and on the left, a definite integral that we'll be figuring out how to evaluate this week. What a definite integral technically is, is a binary operation. That means you put in two numbers and you come up with one answer. And the input numbers we do call the bounds of the definite integral. We're going to take those two numbers, do something with them, and we're going to come up with a single number that's our final answer. Now what's probably the good news about definite integrals is that you don't need to mess around with the plus k or plus c at the ends of your problems. That's because we do just get one answer from the problem. And so there's no reason to think about infinitely many other answers that could go with it. So you just get the number and you're done. The basic way that you find that answer for definite integrals has three basic steps. You first of all find the antiderivative, exactly what we did last week. Most of the time, you're going to add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. But you figure out whatever the antiderivative is. Then you plug the two bounds into that antiderivative. You evaluate it at each of those two numbers. 
And finally, you're going to subtract. And while that sounds kind of odd, it gives you really a very valuable answer that we'll use for a whole bunch of things as we go along. So you find the antiderivative, you plug in the two numbers, and finally you subtract. So here's a very typical antiderivative. It says we're supposed to find the definite integral from 1 to 5 of x squared dx. So the function I care about is x squared, and the bounds are going to be 1 and 5. And again, the first step is find the antiderivative. So what I've got to do is take 2 plus 1, I get 3, divide by that 3, and I could either write x cubed over 3, or what I have here is 1 third x cubed. Now, I didn't bother with the plus k, because again, we're not really going to be using that as we get our answer. What I've got to do now is plug in the two numbers that we have. I have to evaluate this function at 1 and 5. When people write this down, a lot of times they'll put the antiderivative, and right after it they'll put a vertical line with the numbers that you have to plug in after that. You don't necessarily have to do that yourself, but I want to show you that because both in this class and especially if you take other math classes later on, you may see that notation, and all it means is you're going to evaluate this function at 5 and 1. So if I do that, I would take 5 cubed is 125, and I get 125 thirds. 1 cubed is 1, so I have 1 third, and I do subtract those two numbers. Honestly, I would probably write the answer as 124 thirds, but that happens to be the same thing as 41 and a third. Either of those would be a perfectly good way of writing this answer. And you will find that a lot of times you get fractions as your answers on problems like this. That's okay, no problem at all with doing that. When you do the plugging in, it is always you plug in the number on top first, and then you subtract what you get when you plug in the number on the bottom. So it is 125 thirds minus 1 third, not the other way around. And I'm just going to take one other quick look at that same problem. If you did put the plus k on your antiderivative, when you plug in, what's going to happen is you'll get 125 thirds plus k and 1 third plus k. But when you do the subtracting, Part of that answer would just be k minus k, and they just cancel out. That's why you don't need to worry about putting the plus k in there when you do the antiderivative for definite integrals. So we're going to see if you can look at another problem here. We want to find the antiderivative from 0 to pi over 4 of cosine x dx. And again, whenever you see the question marks, you might want to pause the video before you go on. So the antiderivative of cosine is just sine, and we need to evaluate sine at pi over 4 and 0. If you did this totally by hand, what you might remember is that the sine of pi over 4 happens to be square root of 2 over 2. The sine of 0 is 0, so you got to subtract those, and the answer is going to be the square root of 2 over 2. You could also just type that all into a calculator, take the sine of pi over 4 minus the sine of 0, and assuming your calculator is set in radians, you do get about 0 0.707, which is the square root of 2 over 2. Here's one that's easier to do, especially if you don't worry about a decimal value. The definite integral from 5 to 7 of e to the x dx. And you want to remember that the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x. And so what I've got to do is take e to the 7th minus e to the 5th. And honestly, if I were doing this problem myself, that's all I'd write, is just e to the 7th minus e to the 5th, and I'm calling it a day there. You could do that on your calculator. e to the is just second natural log and you get the same answer just written as a decimal, mine 48.22 approximately. Here's another example. We want to find the definite integral from negative 4 to 4 of 3x dx. 
you can think of 3x as 3x to the first. So if you add 1 to the exponent, you get x squared. We got 3 halves x squared that we need to evaluate at 4 and negative 4. And when we work all of that out, you end up getting exact opposites. And so we have 0 as our final answer. It's actually very common to get 0 for answers when you're doing definite integrals. It basically just means sometimes this function's positive and sometimes it's negative, and that's okay. And one more question here. We want to find the definite integral from 4 to 2 of 6x dx. The thing that's important about this one is that the bounds are written backwards from what they were on all of the other problems we looked at. The larger number is actually on the bottom this time. That's okay. You still need to plug in the top number first and then the bottom number and subtract in that order. So what I have to do on this problem is take 3 times 2 squared, 3 times 4, which is 12, and then 3 times 4 squared, or 3 times 16, is 48. And when I subtract those, I get a negative answer. Our answer is negative 36. We'll talk later about what that actually means, but we do end up with a negative number for our answer. So this one may take you a while to work out, and we'll talk about some shortcuts you can do after you've tried this. But we do have the definite integral from 4 to 9 of 3 square root of x dx. So just like you did last week when we were finding antiderivatives, what you want to do is think of this as an exponent. So 3 square root of x is the same thing as 3x to the 1 half power. And that's what I need to find the antiderivative of. So to find the antiderivative, I've got to take 1 half plus 1, which is going to be 3 halves. And then I divide by 3 halves, which of course is the same as multiplying by 2 thirds. Now I've got 2 thirds times 3, so the 3's cancel. And that's why what you might do is write the answer as 2x to the 3 halves power. If you were using a book and you looked up the answer in the back, they would almost certainly write 2 square root of x cubed. And when I evaluate this, that's kind of what I'm going to think through as well. But we have either of those expressions that we've got to plug in 9 and 4 into. Now you can kind of look at that last expression and realize what the answer's got to end up being. Because we have the square root of 9 would be 3. 3 cubed is 27, times 2 would be 54. So when I plug in the top number, I'm going to get 54. When I plug in the bottom number, the square root of 4 would be 2. 2 cubed is 8, and 2 times 8 gives me 16. So what I'm going to have here is 54 minus 16, which I'm pretty sure is 38. Of course, you can just type that straight into your calculator and get that exact same answer, 2 times 9 to the 3 halves minus 2 times 4 to the 3 halves, and yeah, the answer is going to be 38. So I want to show you another way that you can do definite integrals as well, and this involves the graphing feature on your graphing calculator. Now, I have a picture of a TI-83, but what I'm actually going to show you are screenshots that would be from a TI-84, because I'm pretty sure that's what all of you guys use when you're working through things. And it looks just a little bit different, so I wanted to show the one that's going to look the closest to what you use. First thing I would do is hit the window key on your calculator up at the top, and then what I would do is make sure that things are set to do a fairly standard window. You could actually hit zoom standard, and that'll take you to counting to 10 in every direction. If for some reason you see thetas there instead of just x's and y's, that means you're still set to graph in polar coordinates from like last semester. And you might want to go back to the mode and make sure that function is highlighted rather than polar. So now what we're going to do is graph the function. 
And you do that by going to y equals up at the top, and you just type in the function pretty much exactly like it looks. So I leave off the antiderivative part. I'll deal with that later, but I do 3 square root of x. And, of course, x is just the xt theta n key that you have down below the, or next to the alphabet key. And you type everything in, and you're going to hit the graph key. And hopefully when you hit the graph key, you'll have something that looks kind of like what I have there. Although, if your dimensions are a little bit different, it may look slightly different. That's not going to affect the answer. The key to what we're going to be working with on this is the calculate menu. It is calculate, not calculus, although we're going to do some calculus with it. What you want to do is hit second and the trace key up at the top. And you're going to get into a menu that looks kind of like what we have right here. And you'll notice that the final choice in there says antiderivative of f of x dx. That's the one we're going to choose. You actually can use this same menu to find things like maximum and minimum values that we were doing back when we did derivatives. Although that can be a little bit trickier to work with, and that's why, for the most part, we didn't do them then. But it does actually work really well for antiderivatives, for definite integrals. What's going to happen once you hit that integral option is the calculator is going to ask you for the bounds. They call it the lower limit and the upper limit. This problem, we were going from 4 to 9, so what I do is when it says lower limit, I just literally type the number 4 and hit enter. Then it will ask me for the upper limit, I type 9, and I'm going to hit enter as soon as I'm done with typing 9. So lower limit enter, upper limit enter. And a couple of things are going to happen when you do that. The calculator is actually going to shade the region that you're looking at. And it then gives you the answer, which you notice is that same 38 that I did two different ways before. And it is exactly the correct answer on here. So, you know, you can find that, especially with a complicated function, probably easier this way than you can trying to do it by hand. The shading is there because you might remember when I first started talking about antiderivatives, I said one of the big applications is finding areas of things. And next week, we're going to get into exactly how that works and what you do with it. But right there, you're looking at an area, and it has an area of 38 square units. So again, the basic steps are you graph the function. You type it in the y equals menu and hit graph. You go to second trace, which is that calculate menu, lower bound enter, upper bound enter, and right away you're going to have your answer there. And again, what you want to do is focus in at the bottom of the screen where it gives you that integral symbol and it says equals 38. That's your answer. So here's another one to take a look at. We have the antiderivative, definite integral from negative 1 to 3 of 2 to the x dx. And I actually did this problem two different ways. First off, since we just talked about working with the calculator, I'm going to show you what it looks like there. I graphed this function, and then I did second calculate, second trace, and I typed in my bounds as negative 1 and 3, and it tells me we got an answer of about 10.82. You can, of course, also do this without graphing the function. Remember from last week that the antiderivative here would be 2 to the x over the natural log of 2. I've got to plug in 3 and negative 1 and then subtract those two answers. And that's exactly what I've got written on the screen over here. I have 2 to the third over natural log of 2 minus 2 to the negative 1 over natural log of 2. And amazingly, we get 10.82. We get the exact same answer. So another one for you to take a look at here. We want to find the definite integral from negative 2 to 2 of 4x cubed dx. So this time, you'll notice when I graphed it, the calculator gave me an answer of 0. 
And there's a couple of ways to explain why it's zero. It is. One thing is look at that graph that they have there. You'll notice that we basically have a rotation. Half of it on the left is the exact same amount as the half on the right, but the left part's below the x-axis and the right part's above, and what's really happening is those two areas are canceling each other out. You do end up with zero. If you did this one by hand, the antiderivative would be x to the fourth, and you'd basically have 16 minus 16, which is zero. So I tried to show you a bunch of different ways that you can find definite integrals. You do want to know the steps of how to do it by hand, that you find the antiderivative and you plug in the top number and the bottom number and subtract. But it's okay to use tools that make that easier for you as you go along too. You will also find, if you did a quick Google search, that you can find all kinds of places online that will also calculate definite integrals. That's because it's a very mechanical thing to do, so it's very easy for a computer to work that out. You're going to have some problems to work out to practice that, and of course you got a quiz on definite integrals this week too. So take care, have a good week, and we will see you later.